year these scenes unfolded on a street in Derry's waterside. They were just going on like, you know, like as if they'd just been released from mental institutions. Two months on, there's little sign of the police officers concerned being held to account. No, I haven't seen the video. Tonight, we hear from a young man involved in the incident who's now facing 16 criminal charges. On the word of police officers, he says attacked him. I like using the batons like that's a nice way to put it. And we show how police accountability remains elusive. The system weighted towards police rather than the people victimised by them. The odds are always stacked in favour of the police and um, the, the prosecution service. This is Richard Adams. He's 23 and grew up here on Violet Street in Derry's Waterside. It's a cul-de-sac and generally quiet. But there are now people genuinely in fear of the police here following events on the night of April 29th. It all spilled out as a group of young people, Richard Adams among them, headed home after a night out. A police car drove past, got a light out, and then we didn't think nothing of it and just walked off to the house. And by the time we got to the front door, they came back again. And they stopped the car and they said, keep the noise down. And I went over and said to the police officer, no, as a joke, what's your number? 999, I bet. But she didn't find it funny. <laughs> and then the police officers came out then and then uh, just uh, tried to attack me with the batons. I broke away and came into the house. So that, and then the weather's in the house, everybody came in. And I seen the old gallon outside, so I went out and phoned the police. They complained about them and opened the door and said that they want to put the police on the line here and I'm complaining about these. And that's when they came into the house and grabbed me and pulled me out, along with the phone and the phone chair and all that kind of. It was just mad, like I looked out the door and there was like seven police officers just whacking him. And he was just like bent over, you know, trying to... You know, like get away from it. Um, and what were the policemen actually doing? What just way? like raising their batons, just, just constantly whacking them. You know, if they turned around this way, it was just like kind of crouched over, just you know, just whacking them across his back constantly. According to Richard Adams and friends of his who have provided statements, he managed to break free a second time and get back inside the house and close the door. And while I was upstairs, they kicked the front door free, and I ran down in front of them at the hallway. And said, "Then do you have a warrant to enter my house?" Like, well, I said that the police officer just laughed and threw me to the ground, and uh, handcuffed me and put his knee on my back and was punching me in the face. And the officer behind him was hitting me in the back of the legs with his baton. They just came on and they were the batons out like straight away, and they made it sure clear that anybody who was to talk, move, you know, or even try and get away, like, was going to be slapped. They were just going on like, you know, like as if they'd just been released from mental institutions. Uh, I looked over then and Richard was lying on the floor and, and Mark Robb was lying beside him and they were just like you know, putting his, their knees under his back and all. He was like, go on, get off me, I'm not going to go nowhere. They were trying to put the handcuffs on. He was like, right, you know, fair enough, but you know, leave me alone. Like, and they were just laughing. You know, one of the police officers turned around and sniggered the other police officer whenever they struck the bat. And, and then I was lying down the ground there for about five, ten months while they were doing that. And then they just arrested me, threw me in the back of the land over done the same thing on the Land Rover the whole way to Strand Road. And Sorry, what exactly did they do in the, in the Land Rover? I put his knee on my, on my back and I said, I'm not having a problem, I can't breathe, go and get off my back. And then he took his knee off my back and put it in my face. And then he was hitting me in the face and the head like and busting me up. And then the police officer behind him was hitting me in the back of the legs and all the knees with his baton. And then they took me to Strand Road then where I was handcuffed. They took me to the reception area and just threw me in the floor head first where I banged my head. And they just let me lie here for about a couple of minutes till I really started to complain. Another young man was also arrested inside the house. According to Richard and his friends, his head was split open by a police baton, apparently while his hands were still in his pockets. The following morning, Richard Adams was charged on 16 counts. One of grievous bodily harm, three of assault on police, five of obstructing police, five of resisting police, one of criminal damage and one of disorderly behaviour. He spent the next week remanded in custody, firstly in the cells of Strand Road Police Station, then at McGabry Prison, before being released on bail. They were actually saying I assaulted one of them when I was handcuffed on, on the ground. They said I headbutted one of them and I slapped one of them. They said I slapped one of them with their clothes first twice and knocked them to the ground. And then they're saying I slapped the woman 
and both their legs socket. So w did you come into contact with the policewoman at all? Um, just while they were helping me with baton like. That's the only time I came in contact with her. And she was hitting you with a baton? Yeah, no, they all were. And did you all hit her? Did you reach out? Did you, did you no, punch her? No, the only thing that I said I could, might have done was push. Because I was pushing, they tried to get away. Like. But even thinking about it now, like, I don't even think I'd push them that hard. I think they'd take the chance to. In the meantime, Richard's mother and father, a former trade unionist, returned home. They had been away that night and missed the whole incident. The front door had been broken in. Um, and I walked in the hallway. Uh, there was there was blood on the um, on, on the wall of the house as you come in. There's lots of, of blood on the hall of the house as you come in. The telephone table was smashed. There was a, a chair smashed in the house. And when you went out to the, 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 the kitchen, all of the units in the kitchen were speckled with blood. So it looked like a real battlefield type of scene that had gone on there inside the house. The PSNI is refusing to comment on what happened in Violet Street, citing the police ombudsman's investigation, although it has confirmed that a woman officer is still off sick. However, it's worth pointing out that a court was given the PSNI side of the story a week after the Ombudsman became involved. A Crown lawyer said a policewoman was punched, suffering a broken eye socket, and another officer headbutted. It was also claimed that Richard Adams had emerged from the house, flinging punches. Essentially, this case is a series of claims and counterclaims between the police and the young people. And in that respect, it's no different than many other public order incidents in Northern Ireland after closing time. When these cases come before the courts, they're judged on who is believed. The accused has usually been drinking or the police. But this is what makes this case different. Whatever happened to Richard Adams prompted a neighbour to reach for a camcorder and record what was happening here in Violet Street. What we see is what happened after Richard Adams was arrested. We see here another of Richard Adams' friends, Dean Cook. He's the young man in black. This is Dean's girlfriend running to his aid. That's a coat she's carrying. Let's rewind slightly and focus back on Dean. There are four police officers around him, even though he's now on the ground. The woman going to his aid is his girlfriend's sister. Let's look at how Dean's girlfriend is doing. Remember how steady she was on her feet earlier? Now look at her. She's in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Again, none of the police officers on the scene goes to her aid. Most of the cases that have sort of come our way have been from young males um, from working class areas and the experiences are common both cross-nationalist and loyalist communities in terms of police harassment and problems with arrest and charges that they perhaps feel are unjustified or unwarranted. But in some respects this is maybe a problem that's not common or not particular to Northern Ireland. I'm sure if you went to Dublin, London, New York, Paris, you're going to find young males in disadvantaged or working class areas will have the most problems with policing. When you met with your friends and started to piece together what actually went on on that night, and you, you obviously were able to see the video by this stage, yeah. um, what was your reaction then? I was happy about the video now because that showed the, the way the peace officers were going on, so that you know, could help my defence. So I was happy about that. And then I was raging then, like the way they treated we girls, slapping we girls about the street and all that carry on. Like. I never really had any other dealings with the police before, like, but I just I wouldn't even want to associate with them now. Like. That's the people who's supposed to be, you know, protecting us, and I just don't want nothing to do with them. Would you have had a respect for the police up until then, or would oh, you have no. thought that... No, it's, well, chatting with different people, like, and know, know what's the way they go about, like, they just, they like using their batons, like, that's a nice way to put it. So they do. That would be your, ex that's what yeah. your experience would be, that's what people around here generally would think, that oh, yeah. the police yeah. are very heavy-handed with the batons. Yeah. They enjoy using their force. 
the enthusiasm with which police use their batons here has long been a source of concern. Research conducted three years ago discovered that the PSNI was 40 times more likely to have a complaint made against it about baton use than other forces in the rest of the UK. It's fair to say there are factors that are different in Northern Ireland. For example, we also found that officers were six times more likely to be assaulted. Uh, officers in Northern Ireland carry a sidearm, which they have to protect, which isn't an issue in the wider, uh, the wider United Kingdom. So there are factors unique to Northern Ireland. I'm not sure those factors justify the 40 times more complaints of, of baton use that we found in 2002. I think that the police officers on the radio has to be, they have to be sacked. There's no way around that they have to lose their jobs. So they end up to be brought up in the court of law and there they face charges themselves for assault. So they do. And my charges should be dropped and there should be a public apology from the police chief, Dales, for what happened. Do you think you'll get that? I don't know. I wouldn't say, like, I'm not quite not, am I? <laughs> Incredibly, though, not only was Richard Adams charged, but Dean Cook and his girlfriend's sister and the young man who was arrested inside the house are all facing the possibility of criminal charges. Richard Adams was charged on the morning after his arrest. Within a matter of days, the police had sent files on his three friends to the DPP. But what about the police officers who were involved in the incident in Violet Street? Do they not stand accused of the same basic allegation, that of assault, that led Richard Adams to appear before a court and for the police to send files on his three friends to the DPP. The pattern reforms and the establishment of the new PSNI have created here in Northern Ireland one of the most heavily regulated police services in Western Europe. So how does it work in a case like this? The PSNI does have its own internal investigations branch, but primacy in incidents of this nature lies with the police ombudsman. The police have a duty when the complaint's made, if it's made to them, to report it to us, and, and we are totally responsible for carrying out the investigation of that complaint. Dean Cook complained about his treatment at the hands of the PSNI officers in Strand Road Police Station during the early hours of April 30th. But his complaint was not faxed through to the Ombudsman until at least 18 hours later. It's clear the information that a complaint of a serious nature had been made, but it was not passed up the chain of command within the PSNI at that stage. We showed the video to the press before we showed it to the police. So in, in, in a sense, uh, the, the, the police didn't have the material to react right away. But I'm pretty sure that, the, that they understood when all the fuss was raised that, that something was happening and they were very, very slow to react. The first the police became aware of it, the local commander, Miss F, became aware of it was on the Tuesday morning. So nothing had happened in that 72 well, hours well, to, to trigger any concern about anything that had happened well, in Belgium? We will have to wait to the Ombudsman's investigation to see what she uh, turns up in those 72 hours. But what you're asking me to do is to, 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 to jump to assumptions for you. Miss. The video was shown to the Deputy Chief Constable Paul Layton, who heads up the PSNI's internal investigations branch. But the man who the PSNI put up to talk about this incident hasn't even watched it. You know the full facts as far as you're concerned about what you happened. Know what happened. You've taken time to go through. I have examined logs, I have been briefed on it, I have talked to the Deputy Chief Constable about it. I am fully aware of what happened. The attitude is, we don't do anything wrong. And to have that attitude, when they so plainly do, means that, that there's a lot of people in the police force who are just refusing to bury their head in the sand and they're refusing to accept that they have a genuine problem. Why did you take your time to, to spend so much time looking at logs and speaking to Deputy Chief? Well, it's because uh, exactly that, for the reason that you said, that it's in my interest to know what happened to it. But that doesn't need me to know that I need to watch the video to see what happened to it. But you I, know, I am you're confident. not concerned that maybe a gap in your knowledge then of the incident? I am absolutely confident that there will be a robust investigation by Nulo alone. What expectations do you have of what happens internally then within the PSNI once that complaint has come to you? Well, so far as the, the complaint of the investigation is concerned, uh, just facilitate our investigation and provide any information we need. Uh, of course, the police can take their own management action if, for example, something is very serious, uh, and which the police are fully aware of because it's, it's on video and they've, they've seen it. They can take management information like suspend an officer or remove an officer from duty, uh, and that's entirely a matter for them. Once that was exposed, they should have been off the work that, that, that day. You know what I mean? No point in saying, I know there's an inquiry and it's going to take a couple of weeks. That should not happen. They sh the very next day, they should have been suspended. Now, the PSNI goes to great lengths to point out that its hands are largely tied 
once an ombudsman's investigation has begun. But clearly, in this case, the PSNI felt it had to do something and remove the officer from the streets, although this fell well short of what Richard Adams and the others felt was needed. Action has been taken. Uh, I don't, wouldn't want to say anything further at this point. Uh, the announcement that a police officer had been placed on desk duty was made after a meeting of the policing board in Derry. That was more than a month after the incident on Violet Street. And with it came the caveat that no inference should be drawn from the move. This affects an officer's career. This isn't a decision that the Deputy Chief Constable takes lightly. They're dealing with a person's career, their family life and their family. So we have to be absolutely sure that any action he's going to take. So it's not a case of knee-jerking a reaction um, so that, you know, to, to suit people's purposes. What about the life of, and the career and the family life of Richard Adams? Yes, and that's, now isn't, isn't that part of the full investigation? By I'm sorry, there was no reaction. He was charged in 16 counts on the Monday morning and, and uh, sent to McGabry. Yet there was no one in the intervening period within the PSNI raised any concerns about anything that happened in Violet Street. If we hadn't had the video, if the video wasn't released, Richard Adams would be charged with 16 counts. We wouldn't be here talking to you today and there wouldn't be any, any, it all would be put down to what, what, what allegation? But, but uh, you make the assumption that there would be no witnesses out there, no other evidence other than the video in, in saying but that. You can convince me that the evidence that police, some police officers, at least some police officers at the scene will support the evidence we see in the video. Well, let's wait on the Ombudsman's investigation. Insight understands that the Ombudsman's office is still gathering evidence in this case. Richard Adams is still in possession of the two T-shirts he was wearing on April 30th. One is torn, the other stained with blood from a cut he says he sustained at the hands of the PSNI officers. Ombudsman's investigations rarely match the speed with which the PSNI processes civilians like Richard Adams. Generally speaking, uh, in, in, a, um, in, in a more routine investigation where, where, the, where the facts are quite clear, uh, we'd, we'd probably expect to get a file with the direct product prosecutions between four and six months is probably the average. But relatively few complaints of assault at the hands of police even get that far. One of the explanations for that can be the circumstances of the incident. Sometimes complaints had a, a lot to drink and that might make some accounts less reliable. But we look at the whole circumstances. We don't necessarily say because a police officer says one thing, a complaint that says another, it's not substantiated. We have substantiated complaints when there is conflicting accounts. But we take the whole circumstances of the incident into account before we come to a, a, a conclusion on the balance of probabilities. Exactly the same problem faces the aggrieved citizen. If he or she has been charged and is coming before the court, it's their word against the police officers. For many, like Richard Adams, there's not the same lengthy investigation and consideration by prosecutors. He was charged the morning after the incident and appeared in court within three days. The chances are that he'll face judgment well before any conclusions have been reached about the conduct of the police. I think that the odds are always stacked in favour of the police and um, the, the prosecution service. I think young males from working class disadvantaged communities particularly feel that the system is against them and the system does have an, an advantage without doubt. Um, and that probably then contributes or exacerbates the individual feeling that they have been harassed or have suffered badly at the hands of the police and the criminal justice system. For a lot of people on the waterside, the police has been a sacred cow and is probably a sacred cow to the politicians and a sacred cow to, to young people's parents and things like that. I mean, you must have done something wrong. It can't have been the police's fault and all this here. And because that sacred cow is there, um, it's very, very hard for a young person to get his side of the story believed. Are you worried about the the charges that you face? I mean, you could go back to prison. Yeah, oh, I'm definitely worried about it, but the reason I know I'm innocent, so hopefully it will come out in the court, but it doesn't always work that way in the court of law. In the meantime, Richard Adams must abide by stringent bail conditions, preventing him from drinking and placing him under a curfew. And who checks he's obeying that curfew? Was it the same police officer who was hitting the woman, the girl, and the DVD and he basically started the whole trouble like he came out to check on the bail conditions. So one of the police officers that we can see in the video actually using his baton, mm. he called the house. Yeah. That would be quite routine that where bail conditions are put on people and police officers do call to check that they're complying with bail conditions. So an officer who actually was involved in an but incident I who was at this stage was being investigated by uh, 
New Little Loans organization, uh, the Ombudsman, uh, called at the, the home of a person who had made the complaint against him. Would you not feel that that's in any way antagonistic? Well, uh, provided the officer does his job and does it properly when he goes to the door, no. Is it sensitive? Well, what, what do you mean, is it sensitive? The, the sensitivity comes if the officer does something that misbehaves when he's at the house. If you, if, if, if you thought that somebody had battered you in a street one night uh, and, and believe, firmly believe that that person was responsible for that and then called two weeks later to your house... Now you're, ma now you're making a mental leap to say that... No, 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 I'm saying if you believed, I'm saying you personally believe that. Yeah, but that is a different, that, that's a completely different scenario than you gave me two minutes ago because what you're saying is now, now the officer who called at the house is the one who gave him, gave him the height and, the, and in that, if that was the case, then I would have some difficulty with it. It could be years before the public can be given any idea of how the PSNI and police ombudsman view the type of policing we see on this video. The incident may have to be processed through the offices of the police ombudsman, the director of public prosecutions, the courts, and then the PSNI's own internal investigations branch. That kicks into touch any debate about what's going on in these pictures. People watching this program who have now seen the video that you haven't seen, what do you say to them? Well, what they will see is part of an incident, first of all. They will have seen part of an incident. What I'll ask them to do is withhold their judgment around this, to allow the proper authorities, which is Nulo Loan's office and her staff, to carry out a full, thorough investigation. Are you completely convinced that the police accept that they still have an accountable role and that if there is a serious complaint made against one of its officers, that they themselves are still seen to take action, never mind what you do? Well, uh, 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 I'm not sure how the police would, would, would view that or the attitude to the, of the police, but uh, certainly there's a, there's a risk uh, when an independent body is dealing with all complaints that, uh, that, that the, the management, the organisation, see it as someone else's problem, where clearly it isn't the pro the, any problems that come out of the complaints or the police problem. You can understand why the police believe they can get away with anything, and you can understand why some people would, would say things like, you can't beat the police, you can't, you can't beat the cops, they can do what they want. The belief in, is that the cops will get away with anything that they, that they really want. Do you know what I mean? And, um, uh, that, and there's no point to stand up to them.